Merry Christmas. I mean, almost yet. You know, it's kind of that time of the year, I guess, since I actually think, where'd Leslie go? Do you want to do the sermon, Leslie? Because you were on a roll talking about Advent this morning. So in light of all that Leslie shared, I'm going to give you guys a quiz this morning because I know we all love quizzes, right? Don't you just have warm fuzzies that just bubble up inside of you whenever you think about walking into class and your teacher saying, hey, we're going to have a quiz today. I mean, it just makes you feel good all over. So we're going to do that today. We're going to, I'm going to give you a quiz. What, and, and it's been mentioned many times, it's visible in the room. What is this season on the church calendar, this Christmas season that we are beginning to celebrate right now? Advent. Advent. Very good. Thanks for playing along. You guys pass. You know, that's the kind of quizzes we like. You know, open book. <laughs> you know, it's right there on the screen. But this is the season of Advent. It's this four-week season where we get to join with Christians all over the world, which, just pause for a minute and think about that. They estimate that there are over 2 billion Christians on this planet right now, and most of those 2 billion Christians all over the world are celebrating what we are celebrating today. This isn't just something that we're doing in this building as the Hub City Church family. This is something where we're joining in a stream of billions who are remembering that Jesus came as a humble baby and anticipating that one day he's going to come back to set up his kingdom and to make all things new. I just think that's kind of cool that we're joining with all these people. But I don't know if you know anything about the word Advent. The word Advent, just a little lesson right now because we all want to learn something, right? It comes from the Latin word Adventus. Isn't that a fun word to say? Adventus. Say it with me. Adventus. You know, don't you just feel educated? But um, it comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it means the coming or arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. It's just this coming or arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. And for us as followers of Jesus, we are reflecting on the first advent of a person named Jesus and the coming advent of King Jesus when he comes to make things right. But there are really three parts of this um, word Advent that Christians reflect on during Advent. Like I said, the first one's the thing we think about the most. We look back to an event that happened 2,000 years ago, to the birth of a baby. We call that the incarnation, that God became a man, that Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem, you know, it was, uh, we'll read that story on Christmas Eve. But not only do we reflect on something that happened 2,000 years ago, but we also, a part of Advent is that we are, we remember that Jesus is present in our lives right now, that Jesus wants to come in our lives and in our world and in our situation, no matter what happened in your week this week or what's going to happen in the coming week, that Jesus wants to enter in to your world. I just think that is important for us to remember. But not only that, the third arrival that we kind of anticipate is going to happen in the future when King Jesus returns to restore all things, to make all things new. And so this Advent season, it's more than just remembering a historical event, which is what we focus on so much, but it's a time to look back and to look around us and to look forward as we celebrate the God who revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And as a result of that, now all of creation can be reconciled to their creator because of what Jesus has done. But baked in, baked into this season of Advent is this spirit of anticipation, of longing, of expectation. That's what I love about little kids in the Christmas season. I mean, if you've ever had little kids you know that they start looking forward to Christmas as soon as they see the first Christmas decorations in the store, right? They, keep, they start working on their list of Santa Claus. They just have this longing, this anticipation for something that's coming. That kind of fades. Actually, Levi was talking. He's not really ex, you know, longing for the Christmas day as much anymore. He's longing for Christmas vacation from school, right? You know, uh, And those of us who are grown-ups... Wish we had that to look forward to, right? But, but this, this anticipation of something that is coming, we long for Jesus to break into our broken world and our broken lives and do something, right? We long for Jesus to show up. And on top of that, historically, 
the season of Advent has really centered around four concepts. Here's another quiz. The first concept, Leslie already mentioned. This hope. hope. Thank you very much for playing along, Gary. You were that person in school, weren't you? <laughs> you were. We know. Okay. Uh, but it, it, the, the other concepts are hope, it's hope and peace and joy and love. And so what I want us to do for the next four weeks, for these four weeks of Advent, is each week to focus on one of those concepts. Today is going to be hope. Next week we're going to talk about peace. Three weeks we're going to talk about joy. On Christmas Eve we're going to talk about love. By the way, Christmas Eve we're going to have our normal regular worship gathering in the morning, but then we're going to have our candlelight family Christmas Eve service at 5.30 um, in the afternoon on Christmas Eve. I hope all of you come. I hope you bring all your family that's in town. Just a time for us to read the Christmas story story together, sing some songs together, and remember the reason for the season. But like I said, these four concepts of hope and peace and joy and love, we're going to spend some time talking about these. But these aren't just Advent concepts. These concepts, these words are found all throughout Scripture. So we're going to do something a little bit different during this season. I'm going to actually show you a resource that I found from the Bible Project. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible Project. You need to Google that. They have a lot of great kind of animated videos that kind of explain the Bible and kind of make the Bible's complexity very simple. But they've put together some word studies on each of these words. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to show you kind of the word study on each one of these each week. And then I'm going to come back after that and I'm going to talk about um, a story in scripture that illustrates what that looks like. So today we're going to look at the story of Simeon because he is a perfect illustration of what hope looks like. And then I'm going to give us a few takeaways each, each week. So that's what we're going to do. But let's just um, let's pay attention and kind of learn a little bit about hope right now. And as we watch this, this is what I want you to do. I want you to listen for a few things that just stand out to you from this. Maybe you want to write them down. Maybe you want to take a few notes. Um, and just see what we can learn about hope. So you can play that. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation, and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible, and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's relief. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavahs for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kavah and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, At this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kavah for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kavah for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sin. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see, in any situation, how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better, but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea. He lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kavah for? You are my yachal. 
In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The Apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the elpis of glory. In both cases, this elpis is based on a person, the risen Jesus, who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. I love that. I um. A few things from that video kind of jump out to me. Uh, it talks about hope is anticipating a future that is better than the present. That hope is something that is necessary for human beings. We can't live without hope. And then it th those meanings of the biblical words, hope, it means to wait for, or that feeling of tension or expectation as you wait for something. We all know what that's like, right? We know what that feels like. And, and that Christian hope is waiting for humanity and all creation to be rescued from evil and from death. That is our hope. But there was one line in that video that I want to kind of camp out on this morning because I think it is perfect for the Advent celebration. They said that biblical hope is based on a person. It's not optimism. It's not the idea that things were gonna, are going to get better. It's not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is based on a person. See, biblical hope reminds us that regardless of our circumstances or our finances or our abilities or our inabilities or our relationships or whatever's going on in our life, we have something we can look forward to because of someone. See, biblical hope is based on a someone. And there's a story in Luke chapter 2 where about a man named Simeon that I think is a great illustration of that hope. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 2. If you don't, we're going to put these verses up on the screen. They're also on the events section of the Bible app. But um, let me just read some of this story, and we'll kind of work our way through Simeon, because I think he has some things to teach us about hope this morning. Starts in verse 22. He says this, his heart says this, Luke does. This came, by the way, this comes right after Jesus' birth. As we're about to see, it's about eight days after Jesus' birth. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. See, basically, Jewish law required that if you had a son and it was your firstborn son, you had to present that son as an offering to the Lord, and then you had to redeem them or you had to buy them back. For instance, I am a firstborn son. I'm the oldest of one, you know, two brothers. One brother. <laughs> That's funny. I have one brother. But if, if, if we were Jewish, my parents would have had to, take, had to have taken me to the temple and kind of buy me back, offer me to the Lord, but then buy me back with two doves or two pigeons or whatever. That's exactly what's going on here. Mary and Jesus, Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem to fulfill this requirement of the law. But look what happens next. It says this in verse 25. Now there's a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. Here we're introduced to this guy by the name of Simeon. Now I've got to tell you, we know very little about Simeon. This is the only time he's ever mentioned in the Bible. He's basically just this ordinary guy 
It's almost like he shows up off the street a little bit. We just know very little about him. But even though he's an ordinary guy, as we see in this verse, he has an extraordinary relationship with God. Notice how he's described. He's described as righteous and devout. That was the goal of any good Jewish person during Jesus' day. They wanted to be described as righteous and devout. But not only was he righteous and devout, we're told that he was waiting on something. He was waiting on the consolation of Israel, to which if you're like me, you're like, what in the world does that mean? Well, the word consolation means a person who provides comfort to those who are suffering. He was waiting on a person to bring comfort to those who were suffering. Remember, biblical hope is based on a person. Simeon was waiting on a person but not only that not only was he righteous and devout not only was he waiting but there's this line there or this phrase at the end where it says that the holy spirit was on him which for a jewish man and this time this was a unique and rare situation the holy spirit hadn't been poured out on everybody yet like he's poured out on those of us who are followers of jesus whenever we invite jesus into our lives and become his follower for for simeon he had this unique and extraordinary relationship with god it's clear The Simeon was different. Even though he was just an ordinary guy off the street, he had this extraordinary relationship with God. Well, look at what it says next. He says, verse 26, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. In other words, Simeon had been given a promise by the Holy Spirit that he was going to see the Lord's Messiah before he died. Now, that word Messiah we've talked about before, it means God's final king. This person that the Israelites had been waiting on for centuries and centuries and centuries. God had promised, the Holy Spirit had promised Simeon that he was going to see the Lord's Messiah, this Lord's final king before he died died well look what happens next verse 27 moved by the spirit in other words he had such a close relationship with god that he recognized when the holy spirit told him to do something and he did what the holy spirit told him to do that's what i long for all of you that you would have such a relationship with god that when god whispers something to you when he nudges you to do something that you do it he's moved by the holy spirit He went to the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, I love what he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I can die now. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. We have no idea how long Simeon had been waiting to see the Lord's Messiah. But finally, after however long he had been waiting, however long he had been hoping, the person that he had been looking for was found in the baby Jesus. Well, I think that there are really four things we can learn about hope from Simeon that I think can help us put this concept into practice in our Um, daily existence especially during this advent uh, season it's and the first one is this that our hope is that jesus will return to make all things new remember he said that advent isn't just a, a a season to look back to jesus's first coming it's a time for us to look forward to his second coming simeon he he was waiting on the first advent He'd been waiting for, I think, a long time on the first advent or the first coming of Jesus. We are no longer waiting on the first advent. We are waiting on Jesus' second advent. We're waiting on him to come back and to make things right. We're waiting for Jesus to return and make all things new. We're waiting for a time when there will be no more sin and no more pain and no more crying and no more death and no more injustice and one day Jesus promises to return and to make all things new and to make all things right and our hope is that one day he's coming back our hope is in the person of Jesus who promises to return and make all things right but not only that we also hope in this that our hope is that Jesus will bring forth the good from that future world into the mess of this current world. We live in this in-between time where Jesus says the kingdom has arrived, but it's not arrived fully. But I think back to Simeon's world. Simeon's world was 
just a complete disaster. We think our world is a mess today. When you compare it to what was going on in the world at this time, especially in the Roman Empire, especially in Palestine um, during this time, we see that, man, Simeon's world was a disaster. Remember, he and his people, the Israelites, had been waiting for centuries for their Messiah to show up. And they were about ready to give up. And the reason why is because they were under Roman oppression. The taxes during that time were astronomical. I heard this week that taxes during that time were somewhere between 80 and 90% of people's income. And I know we think our taxes are high, and some of you voted no on the penny tax, but come on now. 80 to 90% of your income. Life was hard for these people. It was difficult. They were being pressed down, and it was into that mess that Jesus came. And Simeon recognized it. Simeon recognized that a new day had dawned. And when Jesus grew up and he did his miracles, he gave us glimpses of making things right. When he healed someone, when he, when, when he caused the blind to see or the lame to walk or he raised someone from the dead, people got a glimpse of the coming kingdom. And I think you and I can get a glimpse of God's coming kingdom now that our hope is not just for some time in the future, Our hope is also for this life. See, God, in his grace, gives us sneak peeks of what's to come. But we have to be on the lookout for those sneak peeks. We have to be on the lookout of how his kingdom is coming in, or his future world is coming into the mess of our current world. And I started wondering, how do we recognize God's coming kingdom in our world. I think one of the best ways for us to recognize is to develop the habit of intentional gratitude. When we're looking for things to be thankful for, it sparks in us the ability to see God's coming kingdom in our current world. Not just big things, but little things. Small graces is a phrase that I read this week that I just love. When we look for small graces and we're thankful for those, it opens us up to see the future world moving into the mess of our current world. And I know for many of us, our world right now seems to be a mess, whether it's just individually or in our family or in our country or just in the world in general. Our hope is that Jesus will bring forth good from the future world into the mess of our current world. Third thing we can learn from Simeon is our hope is that the Holy Spirit is with us in the meantime. This passage tells us that Simeon was filled with the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit spoke to him and he guided him. It was clear that the Holy Spirit was with Simeon in the same way for those of us who are followers of Jesus. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is with us? He indwells us. In fact, at Christmas, we remember one of the names for Jesus. It's the name Emmanuel. Do you guys know what Emmanuel means? God with us. During this time, we're reminded that God didn't just sit up in heaven and watch us from afar and say, you know, I hope things work out, guys. But he stepped into our mess to be with us. And Jesus said, I'm about to leave, but I'm going to leave one with you who's here on my behalf. The Holy Spirit, the advocate. We talked about that a few weeks ago. See, our hope is that the Holy Spirit is with us in our suffering and in our mess and in the good times and in the bad and in the frustration, regardless of what's going on. We have these promises all throughout Scripture that God will never leave us nor forsake us. That there's nothing that can separate us from his presence God is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us in the meantime. That's what the incarnation reminds us of, that God stepped out of heaven and into our messy world to be with us. And then the last thing, not only is the Holy Spirit with us, but our hope is that Jesus will form us into people of love. Remember how Simeon was described? He was described as someone who was righteous and devout. Like I said, that was the goal of any good Jewish person during that time. The goal that they were shooting for was to be described as someone who was righteous and devout. But then Jesus shows up and he redefines for us what it means to be righteous and devout. And according to Jesus, what it means to be righteous and devout is to become a person of love. Or to use the Greek word, to be people of agape, God's kind of love for us. 
Do you realize that God wants to form you into someone who loves other people the way that he loves you? I'm going to say that again. God wants to form you into someone who loves other people the way that he loves you. If you just take a few seconds this week and just think about how God loves you, that's how he wants you to love other people. And our hope is that Jesus is forming us and making us into that kind of person, that kind of person who, who can join with him in bringing about heaven on earth now as it's going to be in the future and we, by becoming people of love. I read a quote this week from John Mark Comer that really I think is a perfect description of what this type of love looks like. And if anything, if you have one takeaway from today, I hope it's this quote, which is not original with me, because I think this could change how you relate to all of your family gatherings and work gatherings that happen over the next few weeks. But look at what he says. He says, love is to desire the good of another ahead of your own, no matter the cost or the sacrifice to yourself. I love that. To desire the good of another ahead of your own, regardless of the cost or sacrifice to yourself. He goes on to say, love is giving up your place in line at the grocery store. Love is comforting a child after a bad dream. Love is giving away your hard-earned money to those who need it more than you. Love is taking on a project at work for a colleague that is stressed out. Love is inviting someone into your home when you would rather it just be you and your family. Or I add this line, love is surrendering the last honey ham. Um, Some of y'all know that movie. So, love is self-giving. And our hope, my hope, our hope is that Jesus will form us into that kind of a person, into a people of love. So this is our hope, not our circumstances, not our finances, not our career, not that everything will be hunky-dory and happy-go-lucky on Christmas Eve when all the family comes over. No, our hope is in a person that one day Jesus will return And that good will come to us in this life as well as in the next because God is gracious. That we are not alone, that we are never alone because he is with us. And our hope is that he is making us into people of love who look just like him. And so the invitation for you and me this Advent is for us to set our hope back on Jesus. So let me ask you just a question this morning. Don't put these questions up yet, Christian. I'm going to ask another one first. But um, where is your hope this morning? What are you hoping in? Is it in a circumstance or is it in a person? This Advent season reminds us to refocus our hope on the Jesus. And so I want to give you a couple of questions to ponder. You can put those up there now. I came across these this week. I just thought they were good reflecting questions that I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time with this week. But this season, for what do you hope? I've got a list. I've got a, I've got a few things that I'm hoping for, that I'm hoping to see happen. And then, where do you long for Jesus to intervene and bring renewal? The reason why I love these questions is I think that they can kind of turn us towards prayer which is what I hope kind of is weaved throughout your holiday Advent season, that this prayerful relationship with God, that you would talk to him about what you hope for this season and that you would bring, um, bring to Jesus those things that you long for him to intervene and do something about, that you would bring to Jesus those places and those relationships and those situations where you want renewal, that you would just bring that to him because he is the focus of your hope. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So why don't you close your eyes. I want to give you an opportunity just to talk to God. And I know for some of you, that's something you do all the time. Others of you, the idea of talking to God scares you. Um, There's no reason you should be afraid to talk to God. He's longing 
for you just to talk to him. And there's no right or wrong way to talk to him. He just wants to hear your voice. But I want to just guide you in a simple time of prayer. First off, why don't you just tell Jesus what you hope for this season? What do you hope for? What are you waiting for? What are you anticipating? And then, what are some situations or some relationships where you long for Jesus to intervene? Why don't you just tell him? Where's some place that you're longing for him to bring renewal? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this season where we can be reminded that our hope needs to be set on you. That our hope is in you. That apart from you, we actually have no hope. As Peter says, you are our living hope. And our hope is that one day you will return. And we are anticipating that and looking for, I'm looking forward to that, for you to come back and to make things right and to make all things new. And Lord Jesus, my, my hope is that in the, in the here and now that we would get glimpses of your future kingdom because you are gracious and compassionate and you are always pouring out good gifts on us, that we would recognize those with our gratitude. Lord Jesus, our hope is that you are with us. Man, I, that's such an incredible promise that you are with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are Emmanuel, embedded in who you are, your character is the fact that you're with us, and that you're making us into some body. You're making us into people of love who look like you. And as we turn our hope towards you, I know each of us comes in to this gathering with something that we long for you to do, something we're hoping for you to do, something we're expecting for you to do. And I thank you that you hear us. And my prayer is that you would show up in each person's situation. We long for you to enter into our messy world and to bring good for your glory. And we also look forward to what you're going to teach us over the next few weeks. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.